the department that is so important to the security of the American people? Well, I think the president should have flexibility, and I so support a plan. It is a compromise in the Senate. Um, we have 51 votes for it to allow the president of the United States, upon a declaration of national security, to change or alter the civil service rules of those in the Homeland Security Agency any way he wants. I think that is the authority of the president that he ought to have. But I think we do need a Homeland Security Agency. I introduced one in May uh, in the Senate. I particularly put in some amendments that have been agreed upon by the White House to put the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in uh, the new Homeland Security Agency. We need to put the trainers in with the trainees and to dramatically increase the CDC role in bioterrorism, pretending the pre protecting the country against biological and chemical attack. And I voted for a Homeland Security Agency on the floor of the Senate five times. We have 51 votes for it, and I hope we can get it passed after this election. Well, Congressman right. Chambliss, I mean, you, you, you have been attacking Senator Cleland on this, but why shouldn't someone working in this vital department have job security? If they don't have the job security, doesn't that raise the issue of, of people not doing the jobs they could be doing? John, they will have job security. You know, this is a very critical issue, and Max is just taking off again uh, in the same direction of, of just not answering the question and not being forthright in what he's done. Uh, here we have the most vital department, the most uh, major change in the federal government that we've seen in 60 years that this president is proposing. Every president since John F. Kennedy has had the power and authority to hire people and fire people in every federal agency when there is a time of emergency or crisis in America. Today, President Bush can declare a crisis and he can go in the Department of Agriculture and he can move people around. He can hire and fire people. But what the senator is agreeing to is a proposal that won't let him do that in the newly created Department of Homeland Security, which is the battleground for the fight of domestic, against domestic terrorism in the United States. Now, he says he supports a plan, he's voted a plan that will give him that flexibility. He's wrong. The bro compromise plan that he says he supports and he's got the votes for, the president says he will veto because it does not give him the flexibility. And this is a very, very simple issue and one that uh, everybody in Washington agrees on. It's simply whether or not you're going to let the president have the flexibility that every other president has had or whether you're going to deny him that flexibility. Mr. May Thomas. I just say that yes, the problem with Homeland Security is not the workers, it's the way the workers are organized. They're not organized in a way that allows them to communicate, coordinate, uh, and cooperate together to defend the homeland. That's why we need to get them together in a homeland security agency. I introduced such a piece of legislation in May. It came out of my committee, Governmental Affairs Committee, uh, in a strong bipartisan vote, 12 to 5, and I voted for that on the floor of the Senate five times, complete with the authority of the President to make sure that in the name of national security, he has the rights to waive any of those, social, any of those civil service benefits. Uh, 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 any of those civil service protections. But we basically need to, to, need to make sure that these workers have the incentive to do a great job, and I think giving them some basic protections is one of the ways to do that. Mr. Thomas, you've been wanting to be recognized on this. Thank you. Um, Homeland security is critically important. Our civil defense is the area where we really need to focus, and Congress shouldn't have gone home until this issue had been resolved. My feeling is that the government is too big and involved in too many different things. As I said, only 20% of our 2.3 trillion budget goes for, toward defense. They're too busy with too many other things. The second thing I would say is, uh, I was in the U.S. Army as an officer in the 60s, and I worked at the Pentagon and served in Germany, and I know a bit about the military, and I think that we need to fundamentally reform these agencies, particularly intelligence, which, by the way, is not part of Homeland Security, um, so that as opposed to just adding another layer of bureaucracy, we need fundamental reform here. Gentlemen, thank you. We're going to take a brief pause, regroup, and when we come back, the candidates will question each other. Welcome back. We're now at the point of our debate where the candidates have the chance to question each other. Each candidate can ask each of his opponents one question. We've determined the order of this questioning by a drawing, and Mr. Chambliss, you now have the opportunity to pose your questions. Thank you, John. Sandy, we were just talking about the Department of Homeland Security, and you do have some experience in intelligence, which is a 
uh, a key function of this war on, on terrorism and a key function of being integrated into the Department of Homeland Security. I'm curious about your thoughts on the fact that we're not bringing our intelligence community, the FBI, the CIA, NSA, under this umbrella. Uh, do you agree with that or do you think that it probably should be under there? Well, I wouldn't answer that by saying how the organization chart should look. I'm just saying that Homeland Security and the civil defense that we need at the local level, improving our local fire, police, emergency response, these are the critical issues. Um, and, and looking at intelligence, intelligence includes things about knowing who's here in our country illegally. You know, they said the Immigration and Naturalization Service can't keep track of <coughs> illegal immigrants, for example. And they need a $5 billion computer system in three years to be able to do it. Well, look, I've worked in the computer industry and keeping track of on hundreds of thousands of shareholders, millions of shareholders, billions of credit card holders in their transactions. And this could be privatized and it could be done immediately. We could keep track of these people. So I, I think there are many elements, but I, I appreciate your question. It is, it, I think it's more than organizational, though. Well, I think this is the most critical aspect of the new, this new Department of Homeland Security because the way we've got it set up now, and I was pleased to be a part of working this out because information sharing with, from an intelligence perspective is something that I have a great concern about. And what we're going to do in this new Department of Homeland Security is be the funnel that receives all of the intelligence information from our intelligence gatherers around the world and domestically. Take that information, redact it and declassify it and disseminate it both horizontally, vertically, all the way down to the state and local level so that sheriffs like uh, Bill Hudson in Cobb County or Butch Conway up in, in Gwinnett County can have information relative to intelligence on activity of terrorist organizations that may be taking place right here in our hometowns. That is a critically important aspect of this new Department of Homeland Security. Congressman, uh, time for your next question now, okay. Senator Cleveland. Uh, Mr. Cleveland, you uh, have been running very negative ads against me for months and months now. It started back in June or July. And uh, your most recent ones say that uh, Saxby Chambliss is bad for families. Now, you know, my mother's 85 years old. She lives on Social Security and Medicare, two valuable programs that I have worked hard in my eight years in Congress to strengthen and improve. I've been married to the same lady for almost 36 years now. She's a retired school teacher, one more great woman. I've got uh, two great kids. Uh, one of them is a school teacher. She's married to a farmer, just very solid, down-to-earth people. I've got two great grandchildren. Now, Mr. Cleland, I'd just like to know why you think, and if you can explain to my family and to the people of Georgia, why Saxby Chambliss is bad for families. Well, first of all, in terms of uh, <clears throat> negative ads, uh, my Republican opponent uh, refused to sign a clean campaign pledge at the beginning of this campaign. I signed it. Secondly of all, I'm not the one who put Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein up on the TV picture uh, with uh, his opponent. Uh, may I just say that uh, if you support, uh, which you do, uh, a privatization scheme for Social Security that cuts uh, Social Security benefits by 40%, that's bad for families. If you vote, as you have done, uh, for a, uh, bank, a bill to bankrupt uh, Medicare and vote to cut $270 billion from Medicare, that's bad for families. And when you vote against more teachers for the classroom, Head Start, and uh, safe and drug-free schools, that's bad for families. We don't have enough time for me to go on to talk about how the Republican opponent here is bad for families. Well, unfortunately, Max, uh, you can't substantiate your votes because you don't have the votes. The ones that you've shown in your ad are simply procedural votes that, uh, that I cast that had nothing to do with the issues that you're talking about. But when you say Saxby Chambliss is bad for families, I mean, I'm a guy who has been very active in my community. I'm very active in my church. I'm very proud of that. And for you to come out and get very personal, and I know you're getting desperate in the late days of this campaign, but for you to be that critical without any factual substantiation simply is the worst form of politics I've ever seen. And the, the ad that we ran was a truthful ad. You turned it into something that it wasn't or tried to, but you've never responded for your votes. Right. You're not answering your votes now, and you didn't answer them when we put them in the ad. Congressman Chambliss, I have to call time on you here. It's uh, time now for you, Senator Cleland, to pose questions of your two opponents. Uh, first of all, for my Republican opponent, um, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm proud to have the support of Senator Zell Miller uh, in this race. He put together
probably the most innovative program for higher education in the nation when he put together the Hope Scholarship for Georgia. I have to ask for your question, sir. And, and I want to know why the Republican opponent in this, my Republican opponent in this race, voted against a federal Hope Scholarship program. Well, I've never voted against the Federal Hope Scholarship Program. I'm very sensitive to the needs of education. I said earlier, I'm very fortunate in that my best friend, my best campaigner, my best advisor is my wife of 30 years, uh, 35 years, who just retired after 30 years in the classroom. And as I'm fond of saying, when I go around America talking about education, when I want to know what the issue is and I want to know what the answer is, I don't call a bureaucrat at the U.S. Department of Education. I call home because I know when she's fought the wars on education over the years, she knows what the real answers are. And the answers come not just from, from uh, people in Washington. At very few times you get the real answer from Washington. The answers come from the great teachers that we've got in our state, from the parents in our state, as well as from the students. And when you get students, parents, and teachers working together, particularly with the President's No Child Left Behind package, we're gonna improve the quality of education. We should continue to improve it, and we're going to. Well, my Republican opponent did vote against the Federal Hope Scholarship Program, a program that I support, uh, and he has denied hope to thousands of kids who could benefit from that program. And I think that's terribly unfortunate. Your question now for uh, Sandy Thomas. I'd like for Mr. Thomas, my fellow Vietnam era veteran here, to talk a little bit about uh, how he feels about the federal tax structure and his plans to reform it. Well, thank you, Senator. Um, I believe that Americans are overtaxed. As I mentioned earlier, we pay 40% uh, in total taxes, federal, state, local, and all the hidden taxes. This is up from 10% uh, back when I was growing up in only one generation, a factor of four. The government spends $2.3 trillion. That's up way, way beyond the needs for fighting the, this, this current war on terror because we keep trying to do all of these programs for people and at the end of the day, somebody is going to have to pay for them, and that's you taxpayers out there. The wealthiest 1% that get talked about all the time, if we took all their money, wouldn't pay for all of these programs that are being proposed. And it's not only programs for what I consider to be uh, <clears throat> responsibilities that our citizens can take for themselves. Look, if we're going to have the government focus on this threat that we face, we've got to trust the American people to take care of their retirement, their their health care and their education and not force everybody into a one-size-fits-all system. Ninety-nine percent of all people can do this themselves. I would make the uh, tax structure a little more business friendly, a little more family friendly. Uh, I would eliminate the marriage penalty uh, immediately and permanently. I would eliminate the inheritance tax. It's a burden on our small business people and on our small farmers. And I would cut the capital gains from 20 percent to 15 percent to give uh, stimulation to the economy uh, in private investment. Thank you very much. Would you agree uh, to eliminate the capital gains tax? Uh, Congressman, I'm afraid that uh, that violates the protocol of this uh, debate. Well, I'll answer that. Uh, I agree to cut capital gains from 20% to 15% as an economic stimulus, and I think we need it. All right, I now let's move to San Sandy Thomas, who has a question now for each of his opponents. Uh, Senator Cleland, um, I'm all for tax cuts as well, and I think that's how we can reinvigorate our economy, but we have this terrible spending problem. The National Taxpayer Union did a tally of all votes of all Congress people in 2001, and they tallied up for you that you voted for, voted for increases of $223 billion in 2001. That's an increase of 11% in a year, one year alone. I mean, who's going to pay for this? Well, first of all, uh, I voted for a $1.3 trillion tax cut last year to last over the next nine years in terms of personal income tax reduction, inheritance tax reduction, marriage penalty reduction, and I would go further than that in order to stimulate our economy, cut capital gains from 20% to 15%. I do think targeted tax cuts are a way of stimulating the economy, and we need that now. Uh, I get a response. You do that. indeed. Um, my feeling would be that once again, the government is too big, $2.3 trillion, and we, there are too many issues to focus on and not enough on our defense. After all, are we going to ask young families coming along trying to buy a house to pay this increased spending? Are we going to ask middle-aged people who are trying to send a kid to college? What about retired people? And are we going to ask that we increase again their Social Security taxes or add a tax to their retirement funds? Where are we going to get this money? You have a question now for Congressman Chambliss. <clears throat> Congressman Chambliss, uh, I, 
mentioned the $223 billion that uh, the Senator proposed or voted for in 2001. Uh, 223 billion. Yet the same study, the National Taxpayer Union says that you propose 223 billion in increases. Uh, you did propose 170 million in cuts, but that's $1,300 in increases for every dollar in reduction. Same question. How do we pay for this? Well, Sandy, what happens is that every time we pass a major piece of legislation, for example, the, the farm bill that we passed or the defense appropriation bill that we passed, it gets scored by CBO, and that's where National Taxpayers Union gets their, their figures from. I've been endorsed by every taxpayer group in America. Uh, I have been a strong supporter of reducing the size and scope of the federal government, thereby reducing the need for taxation. I'm one of the folks who agrees with you that we ought to take the current tax code and we ought to rip it up by its roots, throw it away, and start over. Let's, let's have the debate on a national sales tax, a flat tax. I happen to think a sales tax is probably the better way to go. Um, but I think there are things that we need to do that as long as we have the current leadership and the Democratic uh, leadership in the Senate, we're not going to have. And you do have a chance for rebuttal, if you have uh, any. Uh, uh, thank you for those comments. Um, well, once again, the National Taxpayer Union looks upon you favorably in, in some ways, and so their numbers are probably pretty reliable, I would say. Um, the reason that I'm running is because I don't see a significant difference between the Republicans and the Democrats in terms of limiting the role of government. It continues to grow regardless of who, which party is in power, whether it's in the presidency or it's in the Congress. Um, this information, if you would like to see it, is uh, on a link on my website at www.sandy2002.com, the right. independent Thank you, thank you very study. much. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to take another brief pause. When we come back, we'll resume questioning from our panel of journalists. Welcome back to our debate involving the three men running for U.S. Senate from Georgia. We're going to resume questioning now from our panel of journalists, and we'll begin with Bill Nygut. Thanks, John. Um, I'd like to ask about the role of Zell Miller in this election. And, and I do this uh, because I think the way in which you've each positioned yourself in terms of Zell Miller might give voters some better sense of just what kind of message you're trying to get out in this campaign. Senator Cleveland, you have Zell Miller's endorsement. He is in commercials for you. And yet, there is no doubt that your voting record in the United States Senate is considerably different from the way Zell Miller has voted on many major issues. And if I could pose the second question while I'm doing this, Mr. Chambliss, you've held up Zell Miller as a, as a, as a model for uh, uh, understanding the issues and um, uh, dealing with uh, things the way you'd like things dealt with. But, he's, but, but part of that is he's supporting your opponent. It's a strange situation. Why don't we start with you on that? Okay, well, you know, it's a question of leadership, Bill. Uh, here we have the junior senator from Georgia providing strong leadership in the United States Senate uh, when the senior senator is not. And uh, Zell Miller votes the way a majority of Georgians think. Now, uh, they're out there now saying, well, he vote, uh, Mr. Cleland votes with him four out of five times. Uh, the problem is those four times he votes with him are to open the session, to close the session, to approve the journal, and uh, to vote to go home. It's that fifth vote. It's the fifth vote on, on making tax cuts permanent. It's the fifth vote on gutting the tax bill of, of President Bush. It's the fifth vote on allowing the creation of the, the president's and Zell Miller's Department of Homeland Security. But do you Security. believe that Zell Miller's endorsement of Max Cleland is disingenuous? No. Zell Miller is a Democrat, and I fully expected him to endorse him. Um, you know, we've been fortunate to get a number of Democrats to endorse us, and I'm very proud of that fact. I'm very humbled by it. But I understand Senator Miller is, is a colleague in the United States Senate on the Democratic side, and it's only natural that he endorse him. Senator Cleveland? Well, let me just say, since you mentioned uh, Senator Miller's name, um, I've known Senator Miller in many iterations as a senator, as a governor, as lieutenant governor. We've been friends for well over 30 years. Uh, we're colleagues in the Senate now, and it's a pleasure to work with him. I think we make a great team for Georgia. Probably no one else in my generation has meant more to the hope of Georgia students than to uh, then, then Governor Zell Miller, when he put together the Hope Scholarship Program, and I'm sad to see my Republican opponent vote against a, Rep a, a federal Hope Scholarship Program. But Senator Miller and I, uh, our colleagues, we're not clones. 
We voted together about 80% of the time. We voted together on the president's $1.3 trillion tax cut. We voted together on uh, the president's uh, education reform initiative. We voted together in terms of supporting the president to go against the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But uh, he's his own person, I'm my own person, and I think Georgia voters on November 5th are going to vote for the individual on the ballot, not who endorses them one way or the other, and I put my record out there for anybody to look at. Cynthia Tucker. Uh, this question is for uh, Senator Cleland. Senator, Mr. Thomas raises a good point when he talks about continuing spending in Congress. You did vote for the president's tax cut, and the federal budget is now once again swimming in red ink. You, but you also support uh, millions more in massive spending for a Medicare program for all seniors, including wealthy seniors who don't necessarily need the help, a prescription drug program. What programs, where are we going to get the money from, and what programs would you cut? in order to pay for this massive Medicare prescription drug program? Well, first of all, you don't cut Social Security and Medicare benefits. I mean, there are 1.1 million Georgians on Social Security. Almost a million Georgians are covered under Medicare. We certainly don't need to go the route of privatization in terms of uh, Social Security and put uh, the money of the people on Main Street into the hands of the people on Wall Street to invest in some risky scheme. So that's one thing we don't need to do. Secondly, uh, I do think we need, uh, for our seniors in this state, a Medicare prescription drug benefit. And I co-sponsored one with Senator Miller. It was an honor to do that, and we have 52 votes in the Senate for that. So we don't need to cut Social Security or Medicare benefits. We actually need to make sure that uh, Social Security is more secure, not less. And we need to make sure that uh, Medicare has a prescription drug benefit so our seniors can live lives of dignity. But what would you cut to pay for those? to pay for this well, Medicare prescription drug We're paying program. for everything now, quite frankly, out of the Social Security and Medicare trust fund. So if we're doing that, why don't we make sure there are at least some benefits there solidly in place for those on Social Security and on Medicare. Uh, we have a difficult time with our budget going down. I mean, our deficit going up, our budget going down, and, our, and, and the red ink that you say. But uh, one of the ways I would deal with this is to help turn our economy around with the targeted tax cuts that I mentioned. You know, here we go again. Um, Max, first of all, didn't, ask question, didn't answer your question, Cynthia, and thank you for staying on him to make an answer. Now, what he just said was, you don't cut Social Security and Medicare benefits to pay for a super expensive prescription drug program, but then you turn around and you spend the Social Security Trust Fund to pay for the Medicare prescription drug benefit. Now, that's, that's wrong. That's just not the way to go. And let me tell you, this is a fundamental difference in the physical policy and the physical philosophy between Mr. Cleland and myself. You know, on the House side, we acted very responsibly when it came to fiscal issues. We passed a budget this year. The Senate has not been able to pass a budget. When it came to a prescription drug benefit, on the House of Representatives, we passed a very responsible pres prescription drug benefit that was within our budget. We would not have spent a dime of Social Security money, as Mr. Cleland proposes, on prescription drug benefit for seniors. It's in the budget. So, you know, for, for him to say that, that uh, we shouldn't spend Social Security and Medicare money, then turn around and say we're going to spend it, just, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense and is not sound fiscal policy. May I say that uh, what Senator Miller and I in the Senate uh, sponsored was legislation to provide a prescription drug benefit under Medicare that, that cares for seniors. What they passed in the House was a subsidy to insurance companies. If insurance companies could have take care of this, taken care of this prescription drug benefit problem, it would have been solved long ago. We need a prescription drug benefit under Medicare for our seniors in this state. But Mr. you didn't Mrs. pass one, and you just said you're going to pay for it with Social Security Trust Fund money, Mr. Cleveland, and that's wrong. You should not use the Social Security Trust Fund to pay for something. You ought to pass a budget like we did in the House, be responsible, take the money from the budget and, and pay for a prescription drug benefit like we did on the House side. And we could have it in the hands of seniors this year if y'all had passed one. We could have our prescription drug benefit that Senator Miller and I support with 52 votes in the Senate, which we have if we didn't have opposition across the aisle. So this is a very clear distinction in this race. I'm for a prescription drug benefit under Medicare, and my Republican opponent is not. Let's get the Libertarian candidate, Sandy Thomas. Thank you. Um, 
often uh, there's been a lot of talk about bad accounting practices among some few bad apples in our in our robust and free enterprise system but if you want to look at bad accounting take a look at government accounting there's no such thing as a trust fund all the money has been spent there are no assets put aside for these various programs as i mentioned there's only going to be three of people out there to pay for benefits for people like myself and the other two people on this panel uh, taxes are somehow going to have to be raised the spending of the government continues to grow and grow under either party the libertarians want to return to limited government allow people to have responsibility for their lives get the special interests out of all of these aspects and the corporate welfare the farm subsidies the airline subsidies all these different subsidies which are aimed at special interests and give power back to you for your money your life or to the state the st the state of Georgia can take care of many of these things because the federal government needs to focus on job number one, your defense. My next question is on immigration policy, and I, will, I want an answer from each of you, but Mr. Thomas, we'll begin with you. Of course, a major question for this country is how do we tighten our borders to make us more secure without limiting access from people from abroad who could actually become valuable contributing members of society? What steps would you take uh, to accomplish this goal? Look, I believe that free people, peaceful people, should be allowed to cross borders. However, having said that, we can't, we're faced with a threat from outside. We have people in this country that are from terrorist countries, known terrorist countries, that are illegal, that have overstayed their time. The, as I mentioned earlier, the INS says they can't find them, they don't have the record keeping system to find them. Also, I would say that we don't want to bring people into this country because of the social services we offer. We say that immigration is open and free in this country if you're a responsible citizen, you can take care of yourself and your family, save for your own retirement, provide for education of your children, and be peaceful and not be a part of an organization that seeks to undermine our safety and our security. Congressman Shamless, you're on the uh, subcommittee dealing with this and a number of other security issues. How would you deal with this particular John, problem? John, this is a, it's an excellent question. It is a very, very difficult issue to deal with because all of us as Americans are descendants of immigrants, immigrants who for the most part came to this country to improve the quality of life for them and their families. And, and we've had an open door policy and, and we must continue to let folks in under the, uh, the right, for the right reasons. The problem we've got is that we have too many illegals who are coming into this country. They're taking jobs away from Americans. But by the same token, we have a lot of folks who are here, some of them illegally, some of them legally, that are doing jobs that nobody else will do. Now, what we did in the House is we divided the INS up into two uh, separate agencies. We have an administrative agency and an enforcement agency. We funded doubling the size of the border patrol that's the, those are the folks who ought to be doing a better job of guarding our borders and making sure that illegals don't come in and once they're here to do a better job of getting them out we need more resources and we're doing that in the state department and under our visa program to make sure that when people's visas have expired that they go back to wherever they came from uh, we're not near where we need to be. I mean, we're just touching the surface on this, but, but I do think under the House plan we're headed in the right direction. Your thoughts, Senator Cleveland? Yes. Uh, I think the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service is dysfunctional. I think it's broken. Um, I would put it, and did put it, in my Homeland Security legislation in the Senate uh, when I introduced that uh, Homeland Security bill in May. That's where it belongs so it can coordinate and cooperate with other agencies. I think you have to be very careful about who comes into the country, but we can't compromise uh, civil liberties either. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question before closing statements, and Bill, we'll turn to you for that <clears throat> final question. Um, let me ask a question that's sort of, a, to me, an overview of the entire campaign. Um, there are crucial issues, as you all agree, that need to be solved in Washington, and yet uh, campaigns here in Georgia, your campaigns, and across the country um, are based on uh, advertising that seeks to divide, uh, uses legalese to try to make points about the other person's voting record. In Washington, we see nothing but partisan maneuvering, as opposed to state government, where legislatures tend to see cooperation between Republicans and Democrats. Do any of you as candidates have any, can you offer us any hope that no matter who is elected, there is an opportunity to go back to Washington and there will be a working for the common good between Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians. Uh, Mr. Chambliss, 
Um, people are cynical because they see campaigns unfold the way this one has. Well, you raise a good point, Bill, and it's absolutely imperative that Republicans and Democrats work together to pass good positive legislation, particularly where you have legislative <clears throat> bodies like the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate that are almost equally divided right now. I've always worked in a bipartisan way, and the best example of that is my ranking Democratic member on my subcommittee on terrorism and homeland security. Democrat Jane Harmon is a good friend, and she's a person who I work very closely with to craft our legislation on information sharing. She's a person I work very closely with to make sure that we did the proper investigation uh, that we were charged to do following the September 11 attacks. She's someone, along with our other subcommittee members, uh, Republicans and Democrats, who have worked hand in hand to provide constructive criticism for our intelligence community following September 11. So I think, yes, you, you're going to see, uh, you've got to see better uh, cooperation. And thank goodness George Bush has reached out across the aisle. He started out by inviting Republicans and Democrats to visit with him on critical issues that he talked about in his campaign. He is very bipartisan. We need to follow his lead. And but I look your party to has that used Senate. President Bush as a test for uh, Democrats of whether they have been patriotic, whether they in fact share the goals of protecting the country. That doesn't sound bipartisan to me, Mr. Chambliss. But you look at the critical issues, Bill. You look at the issue of education. Uh, one of the first people that he invited to Crawford, Texas was Zell Miller and Ted Kennedy and some other folks who were, who were involved in education or who were on the education committee. You look at the, the Department of Homeland Security. I was privileged to be down at the White House with a bipartisan group of nine other members of the House and Senate who helped craft that Department of Homeland Security legislation. So he has been very bipartisan. Senator, he, Senate Democratic leaders have been accused of being obstructionist. Well, first of all, I've been proud to be bipartisan and try to get things done for Georgia. That's the only way you get anything done for our state. I was pleased to support the president with a $1.3 trillion tax cut. I was pleased to support him with his education reform package. I was pleased to support him with his effort to remove weapons of mass destruction from Iraq. Uh, we have 51 votes, bipartisan votes, uh, in the Senate for a homeland security bill. I hope we can get that passed. We have 52 votes in the Senate, bipartisan votes, for a Medicare prescription drug benefit for our seniors. We had 56 votes in the Senate that passed a bipartisan Patients' Bill of Rights that puts doctors in charge of health care, not insurance companies and HMOs, and is buried in the very partisan body in the House. All right, uh, 15 seconds, Mr. Thompson, before, Thomas, before we go into closing statements to comment on this. Um, I have no comments. At All this right, time. fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's time now for the closing statements from each of the candidates. The order of the closing statements was determined by a drawing prior to the program. We'll begin <coughs> with Congressman Saxby Chambliss. Well, thank you, John, and thanks to the panel for uh, very good questions, and thanks to WSB. You know, this election is a very, very critical election, and it's about opportunity. It's about the opportunity for Georgians to have strong leadership in the United States Senate for the next six years. It's about the opportunity for Georgians to have somebody in the United States Senate who is going to work with the President of the United States, not against him. We have a junior senator who is seeking to work, work with the President of the United States. And if you want a sound long-term energy policy, if you want a solid prescription drug program, if you want tax cuts being made permanent, and if you want a Department of Homeland Security, then I hope you will look at sending Saxby Chambliss to the United States Senate because I will work with the junior senator and I will work with the President of the United States, not against him, to ensure that all Georgians are better off six years from now than you are today and that all Americans are better off. Thank you for viewing in today. God bless you. God bless our great state, and may God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Chambliss. And now to Senator Max Cleland. Thank you all for watching. May I say that President Franklin Roosevelt said many years ago that the purpose of politics was to generate hope. That's what my public service in this state has been about for 32 years. That's the purpose of my life. My life is about generating hope. I believe in the politics of hope and not the politics of fear and, div and division. I believe in the politics of inspiration and not the politics of desperation. Ultimately, I've had my great chance in this life. I've had my chance to take my life to the max. And that's what I'm in politics for, to help every Georgian take their life to the max. I need your support November 5th. So go for the max November 5th and help me take Georgia to the max for the next six years. Thank you. Thank you. Our Libertarian candidate, Sandy Thomas, has the final say. Your closing statement, please. 
Well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, as your senator, my goal would be to, to change the, the size and scope of government and bring it back to limited government. The difference between the Republicans and the Democrats is largely rhetoric. The talk of bipartisanship, an example of the education bill, for example, cutting across both parties. You have to realize only 7% of education here in Georgia comes from the federal government, yet it comes with all kinds of strings attached to it that means that the federal government, not teachers and parents, are determining what happens in our schoolrooms. And by the way, that bill, out of bipartisanship, took out any standards and took out uh, the choice, allowing choice. Even though the Supreme Court has passed and, uh, and affirmed that uh, parents in failing schools can have choice. This is an example of bipartisanship and ever and ever greater government. I believe that Social Security is the same kind of issue. It's not sustainable. It's a pay-as-you-go system. It's going to be on the young people to come up with additional money if we don't reform this system. And we can protect seniors in the system. So I say that we go back to limited government, trust the people, allow them to take responsibility for the things they can take responsibility for so that the federal government can focus on our defense. Thank you. On behalf of WSB Television and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, our co-sponsor for this debate, we'd like to thank each of you gentlemen for being here and sharing your ideas about the future of Georgia. We do invite you to uh, vote on November 5th, and we thank you for watching today. We hope this hour has helped to uh, illuminate some of the viewpoints of these men so that you can better make your decision one week from Tuesday when voters go to the polls. Thanks also to Bill Nygut and Cynthia Tucker for being with us for questioning the candidates. I'm John Pruitt. Thanks again for being with us. We hope you have a good day. All of these debates lead up to Election Day, Tuesday, November.